Looking for the best deals on center consoles, sport fishing boats, pontoons, kayaks, and skiffs? The Annapolis Power Boat Show is your destination. Join us in downtown Annapolis, Maryland from October 3rd through 6th to explore over 300 boats, all displayed outdoors and in the water. This year's show has something for everyone, including free fishing seminars with industry pros, a kid's fishing zone hosted by CCA Maryland, and a massive selection of gear. Plus, don't miss out on boat show exclusive discounts on sound equipment, MFDs, outboards, trolling motors, and more. Make your next great fishing adventure start at the Annapolis Power Boat Show. Get your tickets and all the details at AnnapolisBoatShows.com. That's AnnapolisBoatShows.com. Looking for the best deals on center consoles, sport fishing boats, pontoons, kayaks, and skiffs? The Annapolis Powerboat Show is your destination. Join us in downtown Annapolis, Maryland from October 3rd through 6th to explore over 300 boats, all displayed outdoors and in the water. This year's show has something for everyone, including free fishing seminars with industry pros, a kid's fishing zone hosted by CCA Maryland, and a massive selection of gear. Plus, don't miss out on boat show exclusive discounts on sound equipment, MFDs, outboards, trolling motors, and more. Make your next great fishing adventure start at the Annapolis Powerboat Show. Get your tickets and all the details at AnnapolisBoatShows.com. That's AnnapolisBoatShows.com. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of CastingAcross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. Hey, guess what? It's the 307th episode. Nothing significant about that. However, I think I would like to point out that in a few episodes, once we hit 310, I will be interacting with your questions, your comments, and your accusations. So if there's something that you've heard me talk about in the podcast that you'd like to get clarification on or you want to push back on, or if there's something random that is fly fishing or fly fishing adjacent that you have a question about, then send it my way, Matthew at castingacross.com. I say it all the time, and I'll continue to say it until I'm done doing this, and that is answering emails is one of my favorite parts of doing Casting Across, whether it be a question about fly rods, a question about fishing like the Mid-Atlantic or uh, New England, wherever I, I fish the most, uh, that kind of stuff I absolutely enjoy. And then I get off-the-wall questions or even just comments that I think are really, really fun, and so I always invite lots of interaction. So Matthew at castingacross.com send those things my way. Or if you prefer to just do something on social media, even though I'm not on those platforms a bunch, I do see the notifications when they come through. All right. Uh, so the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast, if you're new or if you've been along the ride for the last 306 episodes, I'd like to dive into what may be a relatively niche aspect of fly fishing, or it could be on the very you know forefront of fly fishing. And I like to vacillate between those two because I like to really touch on the breadth and the width of the opportunities that the quarry and culture of fly fishing avail themselves to those who participate. And so today, that's definitely going to be the case. Now, I want to say right off the bat, which is a little ironic considering we're almost two minutes in the podcast, but right off the bat of the content, that if you do not hunt, there is a lot in here for you, okay? So I'm going to be talking about kind of the confluence of hunting and fishing, a cast and blast episode of the podcast, if you will. But trust me, if you do not want to pick up a gun, if you do not want to pick up a bow, if you don't want to do anything aside from casting a fly rod to catch fish, there's still a lot of information in here for you. In fact, very, very soon, I'm going to talk about how uh, knowing when the hunting seasons are is going to put you on more fish uh, for a very, very good reason. So uh, this is a cool idea that I've touched on in other aspects and ways over the last almost nine years now of casting across. But I wanted to talk about since uh, we are drawing near to the beginning of waterfowl season up here in New England, actually this weekend, as this is being recorded and released, uh, my boys will be out for youth waterfall weekend. So that's that's an exciting time of the year for me. But how does this, again, dovetail or ducktail, if you will, uh, with fly fishing? Well, this first came into my mind in a very clear way when I was living in Pennsylvania. So I lived in South Central Pennsylvania uh, in the Cumberland Valley between 2005 and 2010. Um, now, I was in that area a lot prior to that. If, if you say, like, you talk about fishing in that area quite a bit. And that's true. When I was living in Northern Virginia, I fished in uh, South Central Pennsylvania. So even though I only had an address 
uh, in Pennsylvania for a little over five years. I was fishing there for much, much longer, both in the front end and the back end of that time period. Uh, but one of the things I like to do was go up to Erie and also in the state college area. And of course in Cumberland Valley and fish the tribs up in Erie, the spring creeks in central PA. And then of course the spring creeks down in South central Pennsylvania. And one of the things that I noticed is when hunting season came along, especially the weekends, the rivers were much less crowded. So if memory serves me correctly, it was like the weekend after Thanksgiving or something like that, the Monday after Thanksgiving, uh, that uh, that deer season opened up for, for rifle. Uh, and that was a day where even though I would go out hunting in the morning, uh, I would get out to the river in the afternoon and there was not that many people there. And so I start to thought, you know, start thinking like, I know a lot of folks around here, they do everything. They hunt and they trap and they fish and they fly fish and they use conventional gear and they bow hunt and they use, you know, uh, uh, rifles and they do all these things. And a lot of folks like to have that full uh, range of opportunities in front of them. And so they try to do a little bit of everything. So for me, although I was hunting a little bit, I, I was still mainly fly fishing at the time. And I thought, I wonder if I can take this on the road. And so the the uh, tributaries up in Lake Erie, which were an absolute madhouse, I tested this out. And uh, one time, the first, well, I did it multiple times, but the first time I did it, I said, I'm going to go in the first Saturday of deer season, and I'm going to go up, and I'm going to see what those rivers are like. And lo and behold, the crowds were significantly down. I'm I'm just taking a stab at like 30 to 40 percent down at the places that are usually mobbed, like the major access points. So what did that show? Well, that showed that a lot of outdoors folk like to do a lot of different things, and they're going to take advantage of some of those best opportunities. So, of course, when that first fresh run of fish would come in, that would probably trump other things. But that first day of deer season, that probably trumps getting out on the river on a normal day of fishing. And you can just go down the line. There's the first day of archery season, the first day of muzzleloader, the first day of shotgun, the first day of rifle. Uh, you know, there's the doe season, and then there's the buck season, all, all of those different things. First day of turkey, waterfowl. You know, waterfowl has its breaks, so people stop hunting for ducks and then they go back out on the river and then they go back out for ducks again. So what does this mean? Well, it means a few things. Even if you are just an angler, pay attention to your state's hunting calendars. And uh, there's a very good chance that you can access this online just as easily as you access the fishing dates that are online. But this also does something else that is really, uh, when you get, get down to it, way more important than giving you an opportunity to fish with a little bit more elbow room. And that is if you fish places that are a little bit more remote, these are the dates and the days where you want to mix some blaze orange into your fishing clothing. OK, now I am not one of those people that thinks that you need to wear camouflage or all drab colors to uh, go trout fishing. Uh, there's a very good chance if you're making casts either from and like a high mountain, like gradient stream, you're fishing, casting from below those fish or behind cover, you could be wearing a neon jumpsuit and it wouldn't matter. And if you're making casts from like 20 to 25 feet out, same thing. You could be dressed in the most ridiculous garb possible and you're going to still be out of that fish's line of sight. Fish are much more attuned to motion, shadows, and silhouettes than they are to color. And I, I, I will live by that and die by that. Are there cases in very still crystal clear water where color may have a perceptible difference? Probably. But it is not that big of a deal and it is certainly not as important as staying safe when people are hunting, particularly during turkey season. I think that is a, uh, goes without saying that just the way people are hunting um, and the, the close range people are hunting in, it's very, very wise to have on some blaze orange. And there's even places where that is going to be part of the regulations of where you are fishing, where if you are in that area, you need to wear some blaze orange. So the easiest thing to do is to have a little, um, uh, an orange jacket or an orange hat. And, uh, you know, you definitely go at it that way, but don't neglect to do that because you think, oh, I might spook the fish. You know, what would be way worse than spooking a fish getting shot. Okay. Uh, with that said, actually, I'm going to kind of circle around to a gear related thing before I go back into taking advantage of hunting and fishing at the same time and the opportunities that presents. And this is something I've mentioned a number of times on the podcast and on the website. 
and that is that you should be hunt, you know, going into hunting catalogs, hunting for gear. I was just reminded of this recently. I was looking for a pair of waterproof uh, hunting pants for when I am uh, goose hunting in fields, and I saw how many pairs of underweighter pants and how many options and sizes and bib styles and things like that that they have available for the duck hunters. I mean, even just uh, uh, one catalog had more varieties from one company than I can think of from all the major fly fishing companies. You know, even even a company like Orvis or a company like Sims may have like two, three, four options for underweighter pants, so fleece pants. And uh, this company I was looking at, they had four colors for their most popular pant, and they had probably six or eight other options, both in waist high and bib styles. So that's a great thing to remember as you are getting raised to go fishing in cold weather climates, is that as big as the fly fishing industry is, it is very small compared to even the waterfowl industry and certainly the hunting industry. And so if you hunt, you know, you have all that clothing in your closet. If you don't hunt, don't be afraid to check out what they have. Now, if you're totally averse to the style implications of camouflage, then I, I, I get that. But a lot of times you can find stuff in like a drab brown or a drab olive or again, that blaze orange. And uh, it, it's going to, you know, fit in with the aesthetic that you're going for if you don't like leaves and bark and stuff like that. But that's just another kind of aside talking about how hunting and fishing really can come together. But again, if you if you do hunt, then this is a wonderful time of year. So uh, my preferred way to go waterfowl hunting, I've never gone hunting all day long for, for ducks. I've gone hunting in the mornings a lot. Um, I would rather hunt three morning flights than one long day. Uh, just uh, there, there's some doldrums. There is, you know, especially on public land, there's a lot going on. And so I can get out and be there well before sunup, hunt my half an hour before sunrise. And after about 8.45, 9.15, say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm content with being done for now. I might do something else. But what this does for you, if you're fishing, especially in the fall, when most of these hunting seasons are getting into full swing, is that now that water's had an opportunity to warm up. So again, this is the classic kind of cast and blast situation, although you're doing it in reverse, you're blasting and then casting. Now, if you are on a kayak, you are going to have both your rod and your gun nearby or canoe. And so you can actually go back and forth because, and, and that's something that is worth considering. And here's why we pay attention to stuff in different ways when we're doing different things. That's a very profound statement, I know, but let me explain what that means. How often is it that you notice uh, game tracks, that you notice game sign, scat or trees being rubbed or, or broken or, or chewed on and stuff like that when you have a fly rod in hand? Um, how often is it that when you're walking through the woods with a gun and you're, or maybe you're sitting still and you're surveying something, you notice a stream and you are focusing more intimately on those aspects of that stream because you have a fly rod, you're not going after it with a fly rod, but you're sitting there with your shotgun waiting for something to come along. And because there's nothing coming along, you're focusing on riffles and runs and pools. And you're thinking, this is probably how I should approach it. If you have both of those tools with you, assuming that you're allowed to, assuming it's not super inconvenient, then you can do that. Um, I don't know how many deer I could have shot in my life if I was, uh, you know, had a shotgun over my shoulder while I was walking up a stream making cast for brook trout. Um, it, it's amazing. I can be dead silent. I can be up in a tree stand. I can be completely concealed and I won't see anything all day, but walking, you know, hopping from rock to rock, not really caring or thinking about what the deer and the turkey and the squirrel and whatever can think of me. That's usually when I run into deer. And what do they do? They stand there broadside looking at me in, in a, a situation that you'd just be, you know, salivating for if you were up in your tree stand or you were sitting up against a, a, a tree uh, waiting to pull the trigger on something. And so, you know, being able to give those opportunities and have the the flexibility to go back and forth from hunting and fishing. Um, some might say, you know what, you're not giving your all if you're doing two things at once. But uh, particularly if if you are really just about the experience and taking advantage of it, then there's nothing wrong with that. So uh, again, I, I would say probably the, the most uh, consistent and high percentage activity is to divvy up your time. Hunt in the morning, 
Once the water warms up, the sun gets high, you warm up a little bit, get deeper in that water and fish up until the afternoon, and then maybe uh, then hunt that evening flight. Now, if, if you're able to mix it up and do both, then that's fantastic and you have that opportunity. But I really do think the observation and, and kind of the, the depth of the observation that occurs when you're both hunting and fishing and how those cross over is really, really amazing for seeing things that you wouldn't see if you just had a fly rod or if you just had a firearm on your person. Now, something else that I'll talk about briefly before we wrap up this week's episode is just prioritizing. And this is something that no one's asked me about, but I always struggle with it. And so uh, because I know that I debate about it and my friends that I hunt and fish with debate about it, there's a good chance that you do as well. And that's prioritizing what to do, what time of year. So again, like October is an awesome time up here in New England. And as you get down to mid-Atlantic, and I'm assuming it's the same everywhere else, for taking advantage of that last real run of fish being proactive in their feeding. Now, of course, you do have a lot of brown trout that are spawning this time of year, so that needs to be um, something that we pay attention to. But, you know, for that very reason why I was able to get on the rivers up in the tributaries in Erie and the Spring Creeks in Pennsylvania and a lot of other places uh, that I've lived and fished on those opening weekends of hunting season you know, you really are having to pick between good and better or better and best. And that's really a personal choice. And I don't think that if you spend a morning out in the duck blind, instead of being the first one on the water to cast for like those October caddis, you're going to be bummed out. The fact of the matter is there's, there's more than one day. And if you have a premium on time, don't Beat yourself up about choosing one thing over another, even if it's not super productive. I think that's that's really gets to the core and the ethos of what we do, why we do it, and why we do it. Especially if you're participating in catch and release, or you're not hunting for sustenance, you're hunting to, to eat something. But it's more about the experience. You can't get so bent out of shape by playing the what if game. Uh, I, I should have gone fishing this morning. I should have gone hunting this morning. Uh, I should have gone out for deer instead of should have going out for you know going out for duck. I should have tried to get the 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 bass before they moved into the the deeper water and they change up their patterns as opposed to fishing dry flies for trout or or whatever it may be. This might not be something that you struggle with, but I know it's something that I think about. And so I think it just again bears mentioning to not beat yourself up about it. Um, and remember that all of these seasons come and go. Uh, the seasons, they wax and they wane. There's very few seasons that are completely overlap each other where you kind of have to be sold out for one thing or another if you have a very limited amount of time. You know, something else that I, I think I should probably insert in here is that you can limit out first thing while you're hunting and then you can go fishing the rest of the day. Uh, you know, especially if you're totally geared up or you, you have a completely uh, free day because you want to go hunting and uh, those first few birds come over and you you knock them out and you hit your limit. Uh, you know, it's nice to have a rod in the truck and you might not be in the preferred waders. You might be in your lug sole waders um, and you might not have all your stuff. But, you know, just to have the bare minimum, the bare essentials of fly fishing gear. Now you can get out and you can fish in that water. Um, I, I kind of circling back to this, the similar thing that I just mentioned about, uh, you know, what you pay attention to. I have seen so many fish, even in what I thought was incredibly cold situations. And the, the dumb things are swimming right next to my kayak as I'm, as I'm getting, you know, decoys put out in the, in the, the pond or in the river. And the fish are just sitting around watching me. Of course, if I had a rod, then they would be gone, but because that's just the way it works. But, um, you know, if you limit out, uh, and now you're realizing, uh, if I go home, I'm gonna have to go back to work, uh, then have that fly rod available and you can, you can get after it. So a few a few things on gear, uh, crossover gear uh, again before we we conclude uh, this week's podcast. Um, it's important if you are indeed trying to do both at the same time, out of a canoe or a kayak, especially, to have some floating things. So like a floating gun case is a really helpful thing to have. Um, these are usually just foam lined with an, enough of a high density foam so that they can float a you know six seven eight pound 
uh, weapon. Uh, something else that's important to have is a rod that breaks down and to bring it in that rod case. You know, this kind of thing, if you do decide to embark upon it, is usually not, here's my clearly delineated hunting portion, here's my clearly delineated fishing portion. It is that literal bang bang of I'm fishing and all of a sudden I hear something honking over those trees. I need to put this rod down right away, pick up the gun, make sure it's loaded, make sure the safety's uh, where it's supposed to be, shoulder it, start honking myself, waiting for those birds to come up. Now, if that happens, I don't want my fly rod, even if it's an inexpensive fly rod at the bottom of that boat because I'm throwing things all over the place. Um, it's, it's important to be able to have things in a, a safe and secure location. Uh, it's also important to keep things dry. Again, things get so wet when I hunt in a way that they don't get wet when I fish. And part of that is because, uh, you know, things just happen much, much more quickly. It's not that I, you know, I'm, I baby my gear when I'm fishing, but I'm just a little rougher when I'm, when I'm hunting, um, just because there's a lot more big moving parts. And so to have good, solid, protective gear, I have a big, heavy-duty backpack that I can put really anything and everything that I want to put in it. And so is there en enough room for a you know, a four-piece fly rod or a breakdown uh, travel rod and a box of flies and some stuff in that bag? Absolutely. The rod and the rod tube gets strapped on the side, and I throw everything else in the waterproof bag, and it goes into the bottom. And uh, all my hunting stuff goes on top of it. But if I have the opportunity to get into it, I can get into it and I can make a few casts. And if it's just, I mean, the, the air is dead still, nothing is flying, there's no, no, you know, turkey in the woods uh, in that spot, then I can fish for a little bit. Now, again, you know, this really is waterfowl specific because you, you aren't necessarily going to be near water if you're turkey hunting or deer hunting or anything like that. But uh, some of the same principles can apply, especially if you're moving, utilizing a water body as your primary mode of transportation. So again, a lot of little bits and pieces of things to think about. Hopefully it's helpful and beneficial for you as you make active preparations for these seasons that are coming up. Or if you're just fishing and you said, you know what, I probably should be wearing more orange and I probably should uh, think about hunting, or excuse me, fishing more when people are hunting more because uh, then there'll be more space on the water for me. If you have any questions, comments, or accusations about that, let me know. Matthew at castingacross.com and it very well may make it into a podcast in a few weeks. Uh, this week on castingacross.com, the first article was actually two recent podcast episodes kind of distilled into an article. Because again, there's some folks that listen, some folks that read, and a couple people that do a little bit of each. So this is called Catch, Catch. That's how you pronounce that word, right? Catch, Snap, and Release. Catch, Snap, and Release. And so it gives uh, 12 questions to ask yourself as you prepare to land, photograph, and release fish. So 12 questions to think about. And again, it's all about having a plan because if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Wednesday's article, this is exciting, right? It's called Time for a Good Book, a Fly Fishing Library. So I have recently gone through and made sure that the uh, fly fishing books page over on castingacross.com has been updated. And so there's well over 70 books on there. Now, some of the book reviews are as short as a paragraph. Some of them are a full interview with the author. So it really ranges in there. But uh, I've reconfigured it so that now if you go to a fly fishing library, which is at the top of the website and the desktop version, or on the right-hand sidebar in a, in a logo of the desktop version, uh, it will give you uh, pictures of the covers of these books. So I know that a uh, you know there's more going on than a cover of a book, as they say, uh, but this gives a little bit more visual representation of the kinds of books, the variety of books, and the, really the, the rainbow of, of cover colors of books that you can see and find more information on on Casting Across. This week's recommendation is actually book-related. So I ask for this quite frequently, and I absolutely love it when I get feedback. What is your favorite fly fishing book? What is a book that you want me to read? And, you know, folks have done this. I'm not saying you have to do this, but folks have sent me books and to, to read because they think, hey, uh, I really like it. You know, I'm, I'm happy to send you a copy. And that's been fantastic. Books like that usually get a full review. I've gotten books from authors, from publishers, and just from folks who uh, like uh, like hearing what I have to say about uh, the books that they like. So if you are interested in that, let me know, Matthew at castingacross.com. But again, bare minimum, just let me know a book that you think should make it onto my review list. My stack is pretty big. Uh, right now for books I'm reading for work, for family, for uh, fun, personal reasons, and then also for fly fishing. So, uh, But it'll definitely get incorporated because uh, a good book is worth it. 
Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast app, rate the podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. Hey everyone, this is Captain Steve Roger from Into the Blue TV. And as soon as I feel a little break from this heat, I know that hunting season's upon us. Actually, the first time I ever went hunting, a buddy took me. It wasn't my father or my grandfather. In fact, I took my father on his very first hunt. Well, Academy Sports and Outdoor Stores has everything to gear up for the field for less. Plus, you can shop a wide selection of ammo, shotguns, deer corn, rifle, feeder, game cameras, camo, and more from the brands you trust. Text HUNT24 to 22369 to take $20 off a $100 purchase when you shop hunting supplies at academy.com. Need a hunting license? Pick it up in-store while you're shopping.